we're actually the reconciliation within the play speaks to the broader reconciliation. So I hope people feel that when they see it, that we we can do things to move forward in a better way together on this land. Hi everyone, my name is Keith Barker. I am a Métis artist. I'm also the director of the Forster Bernstein New Play Development Program here at the Stratford Festival. And it is my great pleasure to host this conversation with two of my friends and colleagues here, Jean-Via Pelletier and Krista Jackson. Why don't you introduce yourselves to everyone? Um, bonjour, my name is Geneviève Pelletier. I am a Red River Métis out of Treaty One Francophone. Uh, co-directing The Diviners. I'm also an artistic director of uh, the French theater in Winnipeg that's called Le Théâtre Cirque Molière, which will be celebrating its 100th anniversary next year, which I like to mention. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm an indigenous artist that leads a very colonial structure. So that's been, you know, the work <laughs> for the last 12 years. Hi, my name is Krista Jackson, and I am a theater artist originally from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty One. Um, I now reside in Montreal, where I'm artistic director of Imago Theater. And um, my practice is directing, sometimes acting, and I'm also doing a lot of dramaturgy and new work as well these days. That's great. And it's great to be here. It's great to be with you too here in Stratford, Ontario, which is the um, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the Adirondack. So welcome. Thank you. And Madison. what has brought us here is your adaptation of Margaret Lawrence's The Diviners. Um, I would love you just maybe for those who don't know the novel, uh, maybe give us a little synopsis of it. Sure. So Margaret Lawrence wrote Manawaka novels based on her hometown of Nipawa in Manitoba. And this novel, The Diviners, is the last in that series. It's the most autobiographical novel she wrote. And it it follows the story of Morag Gunn, who is a writer, novelist, who is going back into her past in order to um, make sense of her leaving her hometown and her choices around um, her marriage and having a child with um, a lover from her her hometown and becoming a single mom and going into um, the world as the, a novelist and yeah I would say that that's sort of the basis of the novel. Our adaptation um, brings together threads of her life with Jules Tonnerre and his family, who she has peak with, their child. And we brought forward the Machif, Métis, Red River, Francophone storyline within this adaptation, as well as Brit Lawrence's threads of, of Morag, who is, in a sense, Margaret. Puis je rajouterais qu'il y a tout un fil là-dedans langagé sur la scène. On va entendre du français, on va entendre du métif, on va entendre de l'anglais. Et euh, c'est un réel plaisir euh, d'amener la langue métif francophone sur le territoire ici. Donc, euh, très contente de ça. Mm. Language does play an important part of this, this play. And part of that is about the people that you bring into this room. Can you maybe talk about the genesis of how you come to adapt the novel? And then how do you gather? Like, what is the community you bring together to tell the story? Because I think that's a really important part of this adaptation in particular. Mm -hmm. Did you want to kick this off? Sure. Yeah. Um, Vern Thiessen um, began a relationship with David Lawrence, who manages Margaret Lawrence's estate, to see if an adaptation were possible. It's the first stage adaptation of this book. And he said yes. And we then gathered a team, myself, jean -Viev, uh, Yvette Nolan, who came in to write with Vern to adapt it together. And what we found as we brought forward the the Métis storyline to, to be in, in a really balanced conversation in the adaptation, 
that we wanted to have that representation in the creative team. So we have a beautiful settler indigenous group leading a core collaboration. Um, and that's all of our designers, our cast, our, yeah, our dramaturgy has, has been a mixture of that conversation of how to bring this today to the world with those balanced for the audiences. I'll add to that, you know, we've been working on this adaptation now for about four or five years. And so throughout the whole process, we've had the luxury of uh, bringing in a lot of different folks to come and help inspire us. Um, I'll say, you know, starting with the elder that we've had with us uh, from the beginning, Dolores Gosselin, uh, who's been to every reading and mm -hmm. every experience. She was even here to kick us off uh, in Stratford, which was just formidable, and we had a great time. We were able to meet the elder that's also associated with the Stratford Festival and go to the um, Kettle Point, Stony Kettle Point Reserve, which was just uh, magical for us. Anyways, it felt really, really grounding. And also add all the different Indigenous artists that inspired us uh, throughout the process. We had um, one Zoom where we had a full Indigenous cast with us, and we were able to uh, gratefully uh, be able to inspire ourselves for that Métis thread in order to be able to represent the territory, uh, because we also know the the complexity of our territories with uh, not only the Métis, but the Indigenous peoples that were on those territories. And so, yeah, we were able to delve into that, which was just, for me, just a, a real treat. Wait, for you, for both of you, what, what would you find, like, how do you bring those people together? Like, what are the things that helped you connect with everybody? How do you how do you harmonize a room that comes from so many? Like, we do this all the time, and lots of people who don't know, you know, live theater is different than a film. Some people show up, they do one day, they're gone. Like, it's not very often that everybody is there. But in theater, like, we did the first day where we brought the elder in, we brought... <laughs> another elder, like the 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 Stratford elder in an, on another day, everybody's in the room. Every single person that's part of the production is in that room. Like, how do you harmonize that room? How do you take care of those folks and make sure that there's an openness to this work and and, and, and to the complications that, that come with it? Um, I'll state that uh, I think from the beginning, Krista and I, uh, because of our varied backgrounds, but coming from the same territory, the idea was to really build community. That was really part of, I'll say, the active, uh, one of the active components was always sort of how do we build community with the folks that are in the room for these uh, specific moments. And I'll say also uh, that it was very important that we be very sen we know we are, we deal with sensitive materials in in our room and uh, being able to we circle every day we talk to one another we we uh, we ask if there are questions uh, we are very very welcome to folks having stories of their own around certain indigenous um, either uh, storytelling components or, uh, you know, we had a uh, talk about regalia and we talked about uh, varied ceremonies uh, just so that we could also um, inform, I think, because non-Indigenous folks, uh, settler folks don't necessarily have that, uh, th those, those they don't there there's no I don't they don't know. Have they, access to yeah it, right? exactly like they yeah. The, yeah actively so um there's a real sharing component and what was so beautiful the first day i think was when we went all around the room and everybody shared a story of their ancestry and who where they're from and uh whether they were settler or indigenous uh for me that was a really really strong strong and important moment mm. And to try to um, maintain care around everybody's needs, um, there's folks that have to play racist characters in the play, and how do you hold space for them to do that work and be cared for as well? So we've been tag teaming a lot um, with you know who who needs who needs some um, attention, who needs some conversation. How do we come to arrive at the work together? And that's been really fulfilling, sometimes challenging, but we're we're making progress every day towards what the show is and 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 how it's arriving with this group of people. It feels like it's ours. That's great. At what point does it feel like it's yours? Like like is it um, 
there's a buy-in for everyone, obviously. And, and mm -hmm. in those first days, like we had one artist say to us in that room on first day saying, I had the great pleasure a couple of years ago to represent, like to, to be in a play that was about my community and felt the nourishment of what it meant. It was the first time, and he was an older actor who was like, this is the first time I had ever experienced that in all my years as an actor. He's like, I'm so excited for all of you Métis artists to get to tell this story and to, to ha feel what I felt a couple of years ago. And that felt like a great buy-in, lots of people sharing their own like origin stories. Mm. And then you have your first weeks of rehearsal. Like when did you feel was the moment you're like, oh, we're all in this together? I think it was Top of Act Two when we found it. Mm. There, we won't give away too much, but <laughs> there's something that happens at the Top of Act Two that brings Peak's world, the world of Manitoba and, and that those treaties, that, that land, Galloping Mountain and her journey to find herself and also um, her return. And so we finally landed on the moment at the beginning of the, of the play that worked for everyone. <laughs> and it had to be for everyone in order to, um, you know, Morag's journey is a different journey. So it was about finding the, the right uh, tone and the right moment and the right um, combination. And it, I, I could feel it, you could feel it. We, everyone was like, okay, this is it. We get it, we get what we're doing together oh that's great yeah what has been for you the easiest part of this process so far and what is the most challenging part of this process so far for you i must admit it, it's the biggest room i've ever been in yeah and so that in itself um how do you come every day um uh, and i you know I, I meditate. I, I do a lot. I, I come with a beginner's mind every day, um, wanting to be able to experience the present moment every single day. Because for me, uh, that's what that room needs. Uh, mm. I can't come in with my own prejudices or biases from the day before. There seems to be like always a, I need to let go and come back, inform myself. How do we, how do we move forward? Um, my biggest challenge is the language challenge. I'll, mm. I'll I, you know, I, I do sound really great in English, but um, my comprehension <laughs> is is slower than, um, and so I feel sometimes like I'm always sort of two, three words behind everybody. And so I come into the room and I, and, and it, it just takes me a little while to just, but once, you know, now we're in the second, third pass. Uh, when I first walked into the, the TPT hall, I was like, holy, it's a big, it's a big space for me. Um, and, uh, and like just the, 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 everything's very big here. Mm -hmm. What I've enjoyed the most is how many, uh, the accommodations that we've had, we've been able to get around this, this process. I feel the festival has been, uh, very generous, very much in a listening, um, cause I think this is a different type of process than they're used to, to directors, just, uh, the indigeneity, the settler sort of, uh, component. Um, so that, that in itself has been for me, uh, a, a true treasure is just the, um, that, that access to so many resources. We have coaches in the room. We have, you know, there's just a variety of folks there and they just want to help us. You mm -hmm. know, it's, uh, and you really feel that like even from the, the technical to the, 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 the music, to the lighting, everyone's just there to serve the piece. And I find that just completely refreshing. That's great. Yeah. I had that with Sonny Drake a couple of years ago. The playwright was, I was like, what is the biggest thing? And, and they were like, Everybody like here, even in this room today, is like everyone's in service of the, the work. Like they love the work, they're fully in. Is like, how do we support? And he's like, you ask for something, it appears. Mm -hmm. Someone says, I don't know about this, something shows up. Like says three people show up and go, what, how can we help you? And he was like, I've never experienced that before. And that's kind of the true gift of the festival is mm -hmm. it can do that for people. So I'm glad that that's, that's been good for you. I would pick up on that just from the even be the very beginning because Keith, you were the one with the new play development program that read the script, mm -hmm. gave it to Anthony, and here we are. So thank you for that and and for the care around that from the very beginning, um, with um, having had a reading with the cast on Zoom ahead of time so we could make changes and um, continue to to massage the play. Uh, we've had so much support in the new play development portfolio as well. And I think for me that that's been such a gift is that 
we're not only rehearsing the play, but we're dramaturging the play. And, and the first couple of weeks, we had Vern Thiessen and Yvette Nolan, who are the playwrights, with us in the space and changing things, cutting things, uh, rearranging things, asking the questions, doing the work together with the cast. And that was amazing. Like it was so exciting. And I, you could see the cast, you know, kind of some of them out of their elements, not n normally doing new plays. And, and here they are. Uh, and some, some folks ha not having done new plays recently, if they've been at the festival and, and haven't been on those tracks. So there was a, a real joy to working collaboratively with this team to birth the play. And then I would say the challenge is the cohesion like that there's so many elements to the play and holding the space for the choreography the music uh the, there's jigging the jigging is the typewriter so there's all these beautiful offers and there's so many ideas and sometimes just holding the space to try to figure it out and try everything and it it feels sometimes uh overwhelming but also incredible because right. i mean thank like like we just have some of the best artists in the country collaborating with us so like what a gift but that is a lot in terms of directors director land you have to hold space for that and then finally bring it all into to focus for the audience so that's where we are right now yeah and it's for people who, who have never been in a rehearsal hall with uh, actors and directors and designers like everyone's working together this place is pretty special when you walk in that room. Some of those, uh, you know, some of those moments that arrive where those actors, they show up prepared, ready oh. to go. It's like, it's magical. Yeah. Like to see where they start is like, you're like, if this is where we're starting, I can't believe where we're going. And that's kind of the, one of the real gifts about being here. And and in, in that vein, like, so people, you've got this adaptation, you've got tons of great talent. There's lots of happening. You've got millions of offers and trying to you know find cohesion for people who've read the book and are love the book what do you think they're you know what is they're going to come in with a certain expectation like what can they expect in an adaptation of the novel i think morag's journey um i really do believe is very much uh um, how can i say it is authentic mm. Uh, to the novel story. We we were not able to fit in, I don't know how, how long is what, 700, 800 pages that novel. It's a very big novel. So there's a lot of things that we needed to make or that Vern and Yvette made judicious choices around what was Morag's path. But I do believe that her journey is very similar. Um, so people will be able to tie into that character for sure. There are, you know, Jules Tonnerre is there, uh, Christy Logan is there, there are beloved characters. Uh, Brooke is also there, Brooke Skeleton. So beloved, um, I feel, uh, characters of the novel, we've also, they've also, um, they have their, they're very much their big spaces. And the storytelling component, uh, Margaret Lawrence really went into these, what, were, what are they called, memory banks, uh, movie, I don't know, cinematogra cinematogra cinematography, mm -hmm. um, reels. Um, I think we've, we've captured those as well. Um, but for sure we had the, you know, there, there needed to be some cuts. And so, and, and I would say the biggest difference for me or the, the, the not difference, but what we've decided to, to bring up is the Métis francophone Métis story, which is very present in the novel, um, without a doubt. But I think we place that, uh, on an equal footing, um, you know, Morag's journey is very much part of that, uh, what we'll say, and, and, you know, Yvette Nolan stated it, this reconciliation, wanting to uh, bring together these two cultures or these varied cultures, let's say, um, but at, at equal footing. So to a certain extent, I think those are things that people can expect. I don't know. Did, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it's also adapted in a way that um, flows um, quite elegantly between time so we don't stay very long in, in scenes it Vernon Yvette keep it flowing keep the river flowing both ways as the, as the first line of the novel uh, indicates so that has been an inspiration in, in terms of just the the journey you go on with Morag and into her past and present and I'll add to what you so beautifully said that that the daughter peak is really the the point is that the next generation and giving her both sides of her 
her Scottish and her Métis identity that has been withheld for many reasons. Morag chooses to withhold that side and try to protect her and it, in that time in the early 70s. So so Peak being the, the driving force um, of the adaptation gives us a very active thing to theatrically do is bring it all forward for Piquet or for, for Peak, pardon me. And with that character, I mean, that's such a common story of people hiding, people hiding their identities and fear. Like, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like, what was the reality in Treaty sure. 1 territory? Because sure. there's lots of people who don't know that story. Yeah. And this is kind of one of the, this is kind of one of the prominent things about that. When you say we're bringing up the Métis story in this play, it's it's very present. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, it, it's my story. Yeah. I think it's everybody's story, Métis story to a certain extent. Um you know, uh, I've always known, it's always been part of, of my identity of being Métis, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it was something that one spoke of for a long time. Um, my grandfather, uh, you know, when married my grandmother, it was very important for her that that component not be part of the identity building of my mother's life or, uh, and uh, the whole, you know, the, we talk about the the shame, um, the dark years, um, and um, it, even though it's been, you know, it's always been around, like the music's been around, the culture's been around, the language has been around. Um, I grew up sort of feeling somewhat ambivalent about who I was as a Métis person in my territory. Um, and the Red River Valley in itself is is complex as well. And, you know, the, there's a variety of Michif uh, communities there. They're either, you know, uh, Southern Michif or Francophone Michif. And, you know, you, you, there's a... Um, yeah, so for me, this story is very much a parallel to many, many stories. And I think everybody that's Métis on our cast has gone through this story and this quest and trying to figure out what does that mean for me? Who am I within that community? How do I identify? How? What's my story? There are people who've you know who've known only for ten years now, or people who've known only for five years. Uh, people who've already always known and have been brought up in Métis communities. Our our fiddler Darla um, was has been brought up in a in a in a Métis community, and so those are all things that you know are are part also of the 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 indigenous conversation. Can eat the pan, you know, and and everybody, every every territory has its has its identity or or quest uh, that one needs to go through, uh, and I think everybody does that. I think it's it's very universal to try to figure out who you are and how do you define yourself to the person who's in front of you and even to yourself. And so I think beyond the Métis, uh, this is a quest that we all go through. I think um, in trying to figure out how do we. How do we stand in this world? How do we live in this world? And and uh, what is it that we want to uh, fight for or or stand up for? Um, so yeah, it's been just a a beautiful journey for me mm. to uh, to go through this this uh, this storyline. And for me too, because it's an opportunity to stand together, mm -hmm. and and for all the folks involved in the show to stand together with this story, and and for the audience to stand with us in it too. That um. I hope that they they take away um, a different perspective on on how we've learned our history um, after seeing this show because I didn't learn th the Métis history in the way that I know it now when I was growing up in Manitoba. Yeah, I mean, I I share the same history as you. I knew my whole life, was told my whole life, but it was some sort of dark, dirty secret. It was something we didn't talk about or wasn't, you know, it what. And yet privately very proud and yet publicly very shy. And that was really prominent. And so many people I've met have shared that same experience. Part of reading this play and, and wanting to put it forward was to honor my papa, my his experience and who he was. He was very proud to be who he was. He was very open about it. So, so you know, I'm very, very grateful for that. And in terms of that, like, like because Peak represents the future. We talk about the prophecy. We talk about future generations. So maybe because, it, you know, you get in a room, you start talking about people like talking about uh, missing generations and people are just starting to, the, there's a journey involved of people coming to understand 
their Métis heritage and of this idea of it's, it's very recent that people feel they can identify safely. Do you want to talk about the future and about what that represents in that character? Because it's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful part of that story. I'll talk a bit about it, but I, I'd like to let Krista, because I think sure. it was always very strong for Krista to have that future. Um, it's it's not necessarily, it, it is there in the novel, mm -hmm. but it's not as uh, prominent. And I think uh, we had lots of discussions around this, this, and also because we've, we've also, um, Insulfed or insufed or brought in a fictional character um, that's in the novel, mm -hmm. but has a, a way more prominent uh, ancestral role in the piece, which is, which is, who is Piquette, who is Gilles Tonnerre's sister. Peak's journey, and 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 we also because we have a lot of indigenous folks in the ensemble. Uh, we've been you know talking about. Uh, uh, indigenous futurism and how do we how do we make sure that the next generations feel elevated and and that was sort of also a big conversation that we had was how do we bring forth the uh, indigenous component of the the, the troop the company and uh, give them the experience that they wanted to have in that too right it's not just our experience it's how they wanted to uh, flow their own story uh, through this piece. So that was also a really interesting conversations we had with every single Indigenous person in the company, uh, just to be able to understand their own uh, thread and path that they wanted to traverse within the, 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 the creation of this piece. Yeah, Peek, there's a central question, why did you have me that in the play? And Morag's journey is to finally tell the truth and we're in this time of truth and reconciliation we're in this time where we are as you say going trying to claim who we are and 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 not feel ashamed of it mm. and so there's themes of um morag shame around withholding that side of peak from her um, and there is there needs to be a reconciliation between mother and daughter in terms of peak being able to go forward and live her life fully um, so just dramatically, that that in the that might not have been sort of the climax of the novel per se, but it feels like it is the climax of our play, and that we can send Peek forward. And I always wonder too when we have you know Peekette, and then we have Peek, and like today in two thousand twenty four. Um, who would Peek's daughter be? Mm. I'd always ask that question, like who who would be the the Métis? Like what would what would her life look like? Um, and so, yeah, I think it, it sends us off from like nineteen seven. Like Peek is what eighteen in nineteen seventy two. Yeah. So, yeah, we can look at today, and 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 that's such a it's such a, so beautiful. We get to do this piece right now because you always ask why this play, why now? And there's you know we could talk about the why on this forever. It right. just feels like it's so important. Can you talk about, like, reconciliation? It's a complicated, it's complicated right now, but necessary. Can you talk about it? Because it was, like, in our early conversations, it was such such a, it, it has the, been the most positive conversation I've had through the context of art that doesn't feel, like, heavy. It felt like hopeful. Mm -hmm. Can you talk maybe a little bit about that? Well, we, we don't have, you know, I, I don't want to speak for you, but just in terms of the, the trauma plays that usually get done around Indigenous themes, um, this play feels like it has so much um, hope and so much, um, uh, it, it feels active. It feels like we're actually we're actually, the reconciliation within the play speaks to the broader reconciliation. So I hope people feel that when they see it, that we we can do things to move forward in a better way together on this land. Yeah, uh, having produced a lot of uh, Indigenous plays lately, on most of them, the they tackle big themes, and uh, because it's a complicated history, it's it's uh, it's a it's a dark history, mm. um, and so have had the opportunity and the the, the loveliness of being working um, plays where uh, I'll I'll say catharsis 
mm-hmm. <laughs> um, where people are able to um, look at their pain and 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 also be supported because there's always, you know, we've always had uh, uh, smudges and 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 uh, people there to to support people who are going through. Um, but that seems to be some somewhat of the um, the things that have been going on. What I'm I'm what I love about this piece is that. It's all about joy. I mean, there are lots of losses and lots of difficult moments, and it's a roller coaster ride. I mean, it's emotionally, uh, we cry almost every day, I think, in, in rehearsals. Um, but it is so joyful. And I think, uh, attesting to what Krista was saying about the being the top of Act Two when we came to it, it was so joyful. Like, it's such a joyful moment. I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm teasing everyone mm. to come and check check out the show, but it just feels like we've come to a point where we're able to look at the history and kind of go, oh, we can build these moments and they mm. can happen and people can not just look at Indigenous folks as trauma and da da da, which is a lot of what's out there. Not everybody's writing that way, but there's a lot of that. So I'm super happy that, you know, Yvette and we were able to bring all that in. Yeah. I love With that. With the women at the center. Mm-hmm. And I lean in for that. Can you talk a little bit about that, about it being... Yeah. You know? I mean, the men are there. They're supporting. They're a big part of all of the women's lives. But the the central triangle of this play is the auntie, the mother, and the daughter. And it is, like, so satisfying right. to carry those those three through the play. Right. Um, the ancestor, the daughter. And, and the I'll, I'll add that uh, my daughter just went through a, a Métis leadership course and I was able to bring in a bunch of different documents around matriarchs and how matriarchs built Métis communities. And so we had a chance to delve into that. And that was just really, really nourishing for the conversation as well that's happening inside the room. And the leadership's a lot of women, too. Yeah. We have a set set and lighting. We have music. Our, our music. Us. I think the only um, dude is Cameron is. Yeah, and Jeff. And Jeff. Jeff Cheap is Jeff doing Cheap. Yeah. And yeah, Vern. and Vern. Yeah, sorry. Vern is Vern. <laughs> I can't forget <Yeah>. Vern. <laughs> but it is, right? Like it is, um, there's something in honoring that story and who gets to tell that story in this moment. And yes, there are lots of plays that are telling the stories that are really difficult. Yes, and. Like I feel like this this story doesn't shy away from the difficulty of it yet. I think you, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but you said when you explained the show to me, recently you were like it's a yay oh <laughs> yay Whoa. like it just keeps getting like, deeper yeah. and Our deeper and yeah then, mm-hmm. and then you go there's like an, it takes you somewhere else and it goes so it yeah it does it like it, it like we'll do a jig number and then suddenly you're in this like really quiet beautiful moment between two human beings trying to work something out and then we take you out again and so it, it does feel like a roller coaster but in a in i think a way that um will be uh, hopefully beautiful for people to experience and breathe with us through it and for those that love the novel hopefully they'll they'll be in awe of of how you can adapt something how you can um make choices around the the, the source material for the moment that we're in yeah if if margaret could see this play what do you think she'd be most like surprised by well, I'll share that David Lawrence, her son, who handles the estate, we talked about him earlier, was at one of our Zoom readings and loved the adaptation and spoke to us about her love of the Métis people mm-hmm. and and how he he said, she, my mom would be so happy right now to, to, to be um, witnessing this. Yeah, it was cool because it was the, the all-Indigenous cast mm-hmm. Zoom that we did and... Uh... Yeah, he was very. Uh, yeah, you you could feel he was. Uh, yeah. Emotionally taken by what he had just experienced, so that was kind of cool. That was really cool, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I had the luck of being in the room the other day with the whole cast, and it it is one of those rare moments. Like you you can sometimes catch lightning in a bottle. You where everyone feels the ensemble comes together and and in telling this story is there um. Is there anything in this like ensemble group that is that maybe wasn't in the play before that is now because of the, these people in this room? Like, what is and any pops or surprises that came because of these people, these these individuals? Oh, yeah. for sure. Oh, for we can sure. talk about Christopher and Anthony a bit because we have a couple of black actors in the show, not more than Christopher and Anthony, but we we talked to Christopher about 
um, he's a black man, black actor, who owns a newspaper in 1933, Manitoba. And we talked about him in that character, how, you know, how he would come to have that newspaper. And he's now chosen an Oklahoma dialect and has a whole backstory about coming across the border and buying the newspaper. And so we wanted to honor who he is in, in this, in this version of the play and, uh, and feel really good about it. It feels Mm. great. Also talk about just the dancing ensemble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was just a that's just a gift. Uh, they are just pure joy, mm-hmm. pure joy. They uh, come to the rehearsal um, completely energized. Ma- although they've done something rotten before, and they you know you would think they'd be completely exhausted, but they're not, and they're really into the piece. And we have the wonder of having someone like Gracie Mack, who's Métis, who's also dance captain, who's also helped Cam uh, choreograph the piece, and has been given you know tons of space, and just holding that space, and it's just amazing to watch. Yeah. I just love them. I think they're they're just uh they they make my day. I, I look at, you know, someone like uh Carla Bennett, yeah. who's just who's jigging away is something that she's just learned a a dance uh piece that you know dance um uh, a type of dance that she's just learned and just completely bringing joy into it. Just how Métis Joie de Vivre would be, you know? Yeah. And uh I love how that just translates itself through the the traditions, right? Even the traditions are withholding and, and bringing joy and the joie de vivre mm. uh, to the folks that are non-indigenous, and that's just ah, that to me is is uh, a gift. A well, and it gift. speaks to the like being in a kitchen or being in someone's living room, and the idea that people would just get up and and that idea that that it is it's actually meant to be a joyful dance. It's not meant to be. It's not necessarily meant to be something like ballet that you work on for years and it has a certain point and a certain, it's meant to be enjoyed in community with love and music and, you know, friendship and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. We, we, so you'd mentioned Something Rotten, which is a production that is going on right now. So uh, some of these folks are in that show, which is, a, it is a full on production. They huge. don't stop the whole show. It's like a three hour show. It's got a huge intermission. They go, go, go. Then they end up in your rehearsals. Can you talk a little bit about the like what it is to to work within a repertory theater mm. here at the Stratford Festival? Because a lot of you get first rehearsals, secondary rehearsals. Like for people who don't know what that means, because we have 12 productions going on all year. We open the first six and then the next six go into rehearsals, which you're part of the second secondary uh, six shows that are going to open in here in August. Can you talk about what that is and about what that what that looked like for you? Yes. Um, this being my fourth time here, I was happy to have had a few seasons under my belt just to learn how that all works. Uh, the the casts are split between three shows, our cast. Mm. So Something Rotten, Hedda Gabler, we have one, we have Hedda, Sarah Topham, and then we have um, Cymbeline. And the way the, the this master schedule is worked out is that we get sometimes everybody, sometimes we just get the Cymbeline cast, which are our principal actors for the most part. Um, so we have to schedule and work with them according to who we have. And so there's a lot of stage manager magic in terms of <laughs> making the most use of our time. And then when we do have uh, what what are called primary rehearsals, we tend to do more of the ensemble work and, and build those bigger moments when everyone can be there. It's incredible the amount of skill and rigor and discipline that everybody has in this in this festival and that to juggle it all and to and to take care of themselves to show up and be ready to go and ready to work and ready to build another show at this time of the season. It's quite extraordinary and so grateful to have that. I mean, it's when we do the run throughs and the discipline of folks and then you're going, oh, yeah, we're in this scene. And like it even surprises me sometimes where we're at in the piece. But everybody knows what they're doing, where they're at, what they need to bring to the sequence. And it's uh, no one needs to be told, oh, you need to be, you know, it's it's everyone's just serving the piece. Um, and you can. I don't know. I, I maybe I'm being naive, and I'm super grateful. Chris has had four four <laughs> yeah. times here before because <laughs> let me tell you, it's a little complicated when you yeah. walk in as a first uh, a first timer. Um, but the the 
immense amount of, uh, you know, rigor and um, what it takes to be in a repertory, an actor in a rep theater. Uh, and I'm, I'm amazed at just how they can switch it up and, and be ex inc incarnate. In, in, does, that, does that make sense? Be the characters that right. they need to be yeah. at the time that they need to be at. Because mm. there are a variety of different characters too, right? They play, some of them play two, three, four different types of, t four characters on, c on stage. So all those things are, I, I'm, I'm always sort of, I always find it so magical when it happens. Yeah, and some are are moving from classical text. They'll be doing a Shakespeare. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you have uh, Johnny Goad who's yeah. in Cymbeline and then ends up in your room. He's mm -hmm. doing a modern text. So yeah. even the switch of the rhythms and the way you speak is also, you know, the dancers, they'll do a dance call and they're all sweaty. I'll see them. They're heading off to you mm -hmm. for rehearsals. Like it's like, right, they're just like, yeah, ready to go. I'm jumping on my bicycle and then they're going and they'll be with you for the rest of the night or mm -hmm. something. Or they'll do a... A call with you and then they're off to you're like oh yeah i've got an eight o'clock show so i gotta go eat something and you're like oh, okay and so off they go it's it's an it's an incredible you know it's a testament to the to the work work ethic and also to their commitment to their craft Completely. and and irene Poole, who plays Moreg, mm. is extraordinary and fully engaged and never leaves the stage she mm. has two opportunities to she grabs a, a coat and she grabs a, a cardigan and have a, a quick sip of water and she she is the linchpin and never for a moment has she not been fully present with us and i'll say just to to compliment that that irene has been uh an intrinsic part of the dramaturgy yeah. of this piece as well in the sense that uh she has informed us so much on how to make the this clock go like mm -hmm. and how to go from one sequence to another and uh she's yeah it's the imagination and she's also even given us some really nice uh, um, uh, clues to how we should even go about certain sequences so it's been just amazing that, that will continue in tech as well yeah. because she's the she's the pivot point so mm. when we do lighting and sound in the theater next week uh, we'll be queuing with her it'll be like where okay where do you turn okay that's where we do this now where do we do that and it'll be all in conversation with Irene which is wow. the best way to work and, and people, I don't think, realize you go and watch a play and someone doesn't leave stage. They may not be speaking, but they're holding space in a way that listening and just being present for the whole play is a, it's a feat in itself in terms of like, and it's like someone, you'll hear someone say sometimes, I could watch them read the phone book. It's the same thing with Irene, like just, just in terms of the focus, attention, to stay there the whole time. You're not looking, oh, that person's in the third row or... Oh, that that there's something on the floor over there. Like she is actually engaged in what's happening every single night, and it's repetitive, right? And so that idea every night has to be something new mm -hmm. in rehearsals and otherwise. So it's pretty, it's pretty great. Yeah, she's so generous as well. Like mm -hmm. she, with the other actors that are in the scenes with her, she's not only presence, but wanting them to be the best that they can be in mm. that sequence, and that's. That's rare, I find in a, a in an team. actor. It's I have a lot of like I, I, you're right. I could watch her read a phone book. I know mm -hmm. it, uh, but uh, she's just um, yeah, she's a marvel to look at to watch. And we talked about um, because this is a unique show in terms of like you brought a lot of folks with you, and like maybe we talk about mm -hmm. the people from the prairie. Like people think that these folks are from Toronto, but there's a lot of you've got a lot of prairie folk here. A mm -hmm. lot of artists that are coming from outside to here. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? For sure. I'll talk about Julie and then maybe Kaylee. Yeah, go uh, for it. Um, Julie Lumsden is um, from our community in Manitoba, and she is playing Peak, uh, the daughter in the triangle. And uh, she did a, an early reading of it on, um, I think it was the Zoom reading. Mm -hmm. And it was in the pandemic, and she said she got off of the Zoom and she just wept. Mm. And she said, this is my story, and this is... I'm going to get emotional. She said, this is my story, and I would go anywhere to do this play, anytime. I would do it in, you know, a basement at the Edmonton Fringe. Like, she was just like, this play. And so we were able to get her to do this. Oh, the festival was able to get her to um, to play Peak. And whenever I look over at her in the room, I get a pang of that, of mm. just, like, how how much that means, how much this piece means to her and what she's bringing to it so beautifully every day. It's just in, it's just part of her already. 
And there's Kaylee Crow who's playing Piquet. There's Jesse Gervais who's playing Jules Tonnerre. There's, you know, there's a bunch of folks. And there's also a bunch of folks that are not Indigenous that are from the prairie that we mm -hmm. didn't even know we had, which was awesome. And then I'll talk really briefly about MJ Dandeneau, my Jose mm -hmm. Dandeneau, who is just a brilliant sound designer, a musician. Uh, Métis as well from Treaty One, Red River, and André Naturen, who wrote the, composed the music for all the songs. Uh, there's just a lot of folks, and even Breda, who's Breda our... Breda Garricky is from, is <laughs> from it, yeah, yeah, she yeah. grew up with Festival de Voyageur in Winnipeg. Yeah, yeah. and so, Jeff Chief from Saskatchewan, and so I think everyone from the creative team has a tie. Yvette and Vern, yeah, both, and Vern, both, both yeah. from Manitoba. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're bringing the prairies to southern Ontario. I feel like I'm part of the Winnipeg. Yeah, you are. I grew up in Kenora, are, so like sure. two really hours close. from Winnipeg. Really for sure. Winnipeg was like my Toronto. Yeah. Like, right. it was like, I just love, it was like Polo Park, like those, like, it was the big city for me so it's just yeah. like the Winnipeg Blue Bombers the Winnipeg yeah. Jets all that so. you're totally part of yeah. it for sure but yeah it, and it's a really special thing to for those people because Julia in particular like mm -hmm. I met her prior in the like is this happening or not and she, you could just see and and you feel that from a lot of those artists the importance of this story because it is it's from Treaty One territory. It is Winnipeg, Manitoba. It is a story of the land. It is a story. Can you talk a little bit, like, because the river is such a big part of that? Mm -hmm. um, can you just maybe? I think we'll end on this. This idea, like, what does the river mean? What is what is it? Um, what is it to the story? And because it starts the book and all that stuff. So the Red River is a, a a really neat body of water because it flows from south to north. It it dumps into the the Winnipeg uh, Lake Winnipeg uh, that in itself makes it interesting because we talk about the river flowing both ways a lot in this and and that is very much captured I think within the context of how that river moves um, in Winnipeg Treaty One territory there is the confluence of the Winnipeg and the Assiniboine which is a probably th the most uh, historical uh, traditional territory that we have. There's a few other ones in 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 uh, on the the Manitoba territory, but in Winnipeg specifically, that those two when where those two rivers meet, uh, there's a place where we call the Forks today, which is a meeting place for um, thousands and millennial of years of folks coming together uh, during the summer summer season to uh, meet up. Um, and I'll say for the Métis folks, it's where uh, it all started, right? The the beginning of where the voyageurs came out from out east, uh, met up with with indigenous folks, and just to clarify too, the the fact that Métis doesn't necessarily mean half and half. It's a variety of things. I, I when I when I uh, introduce myself, I, I'll, I'll identify myself. I'll say I'm from the Beauchemin clan, the Grand clan, and the La Framboise clan, which were three clans that came together in in buffalo hunting and on the Red River territory. So, uh, so yeah. So this river, beyond what I think Lawrence um, wanted to capture. Uh, you know, you, I think she was a very intuitive person, mm -hmm. uh, someone who could emotionally very much connect with the land. It's it's like that in in all of her writings, and uh, I do feel that she, she, I think she knew the the importance or the the depth of that river. It's a very murky river as well. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of amber in this room. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, so for, for me, for the, 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 that's how I identify myself. I identify through water. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it speaks and attests to the whole process of this, uh, this piece as well. And, you know, Cameron Carver, our brilliant choreographer, uh, with Krista and and the, the also the ensemble jigger and dancers really created uh, language a body language around river movement and how things come in and out of the stage and so those are things that people will be able to see physically on stage too is the river moving and the river and top. and the river on top <laughs> no spoiler alert and also the the title is divining and so the, the diviners so there's a diviner character Royland. Um, who is trying to find water, um, and as well as Moreg trying to find the novel she's trying to write, trying to find the characters. There's a, a metaphor that, that they're in, in um, conversation with one another a lot. So the play moves like water. She rides the waves and the currents um, back and forth in time and um, is swirled into certain memories and is 
washed up on shore in other in other memories. So it it acts as a metaphor in terms of just the structure of the play and how we experience the play with her. That's great. Um, one last thing I'll just ask is, um, what do you want people to when they walk out of the theater? What do you want them to be to take with them? I personally think they're going to be singing that last song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a gorgeously crafted piece of music and everyone's in it. And I really do believe that. I mean, within all the emotions that will be have been lived, uh, they'll they'll have something to take away with them. That's very um, uh, physical, which is the, the song, mm. the songs in the show. Uh, which were all most all of them were written by Margaret Lawrence herself. Um, except for one piece, um, and I, I, they're almost part, we were talking about that yesterday, because they're almost part of the Métis canon now, which is so interesting mm. to think that, like there's a beautiful song in the middle of the show, it's called Jules Tonnerre, that talks about Batoche, and which is one of the, anyways, I'm, I'm going on a, oh, on a di divergence, but those are, that was the, the, the big uh, last, let's say the big last battle. I mean, there's a big physical last battle because there's been many, many, many battles since then, but, um, uh, and, you know, Jesse, Jesse Gervais, who plays Jules Tonnerre, is singing it, and he's like, wow, I feel like I'm, I'm contributing to the canon of the Métis song, because uh, we're very song oriented too, music oriented too, and uh, it's so interesting to reappropriate mm. these things uh, to make them feel like they're part of who we are, uh, and that's also been part of this whole process is the notion of reappropriation, which has been really really cool. For me, um, I hope that people learn something about um, this land we live on. And, and maybe feel a little bit more responsibility to working together and standing with each other. Um, and I also hope that they may start to think about their own origin stories and, and where they come from and, and what they know and what they don't know about where they come from because it is so important to know where you come from in order to pave way for the future. I think for me, it's the idea that it will be the first time Mitchiff has spoken mm. on stage alongside French and English. And that idea is for a lot of people, it will be the first time they've ever heard that. Yes. For sure. And to understand its origin and where it came from. I think that's a really beautiful thing. It's amazing. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you both Merci for, so much. for doing this. Merci. And uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Yeah. Merci. Thank you, yeah. Merci, Christophe. Yeah. Right, and, and you know, we've gotten used to getting into our slippers and jammies and putting on a streaming service, <laughs> and the theater asks that we go out and we sit beside other people, we sit with them, that we laugh together, perhaps cry together, that we go through the sticky, but ultimately much more rewarding experience of being with other people.